Good evening, Ukraine. Woo ah, wonderful. Cut the music. The talking is about to begin. How is everyone? Good? Excellent, excellent. So my name is Ali Martin. I am the global brand ambassador for Hendrix Gin, which is a wonderful job in which I get to travel the length and breadth of the world talking about, thinking about, and drinking gin. It's not a bad way to spend some time. I also spend a large amount of my time talking about cucumbers as well. Um, so, crossing borders and no borders was the theme for Barometer Bar Show. It's my first time in Kiev, so I indeed crossed my own, uh, my own border today for the very, very first time. Um, and it's an exciting thing to do, and it's something I get the chance to do an awful, awful lot of. But what I've realized lately is that today, as we sit in an airport, as we walk our way through duty-free, or as we sit in a McDonald's at five o'clock in the morning, shivering, wondering why we bothered to get up for that flight, I realized that some of the, the glory, some of the luster, and some of the glamour has disappeared from travel. Um, and that's a shame. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, way back when, travel was this incredibly glamorous and wonderful and exciting thing to do. It was something that people treasured, something that people really enjoyed, and something that people loved. It came from a time when crossing a border wasn't just about where you were going, it wasn't just about where you'd come from, but it was about the journey itself. And that's something that's been lost over time. Um, so that's our, our point of conversation for today. Journeys were unfamiliar, they were eccentric, they were exciting, they were unique, they were filled with wonder, and the cocktail was a huge, huge part of that. It played a role in creating that wonder, in creating those elements of delight during that journey. Um, and it played a huge role on things like cruise ships, on trains, on limousines, on automobiles. But they played a biggest role, I think, in a lot of ways, in the skies. Um, and it's something I've become fascinated with over time. Um, you've got to kind of imagine what it would have been like in the, the 1800s and the early 1900s. Um, we drink cocktails all the time, and we travel all the time. We're completely used to it. It's become very, very normal for us. It's, it's part of our everyday routine. I've been on a plane five times this week, so it's part of normality for people in, in the modern world. But back then, it wasn't normal at all. It was something which was completely mind-blowing to think about. These people's fathers never traveled. They never flew. These people's grandfathers never flew. They were pioneers. They were going somewhere that no one had ever, ever been before. And that was a hugely, hugely exciting thing. And they were doing all of this while they had a cocktail in their hand. And that's the best way to travel, in my opinion. Now, there's a few reasons why I decided to do this uh, discussion, this seminar, this talk about travel. Firstly, at Hendrix, we've spent a huge amount of our time thinking about and trying to improve travel for everyone across the world. We created an airship, our own airline in the United States. It flew very slowly from city to city, um, at about a speed of about 30 miles an hour, so not very fast at all. Um, we created our own bus service in the UK. We decided that the London transport system was a joke, it was a disgrace. No one would possibly want to travel on the disgusting London buses, so we made our own. And we've also created things like motorcycles with sidecars shaped like cucumbers. There's a theme with some of the stuff we do, obviously, as you can imagine. Secondly, I spend an awful lot of time in airports. Um, it's something that I, 
I really enjoy and it's a real privilege for me, but I hear a lot of people complaining about it. When you spend a lot of time in airports, you see so many stressed people, so many angry people, so many fighting people, so many arguing people. And what you realize is that the glamour and the excitement that travel used to have way back when has completely, has completely been lost. And thirdly, uh, I used to bartend for a very long time in, in London and, and also in Scotland, where, where I'm originally from. And I've always believed that as bartenders, it's our job to create experiences um, for our customers, for the people who come into our bars. We don't necessarily know where they've come from. We don't know where they're gonna end up at the end of the evening. But what we know is they're sat in front of us in this bar and we have a period of time in which we can give them an experience, create a memory which they can cherish for the rest of time and something which they can enjoy for the rest of their night. We have a very small period of time in which to do that and it's the essence of the hospitality industry and it's the essence of the bar industry. Um, and it's that exact attitude that was held by the pioneers of early travel. They wanted to transport you to another world, to another place, and to create a level of del delight that couldn't be found anywhere else. So we'll be talking about a whole host of different things today. Um, so I want you to sit back, to relax, to open your minds as we are going to cross through borders and travel way back through time to talk about the early pioneers of flying and cocktails and talk about how they were intertwined. Um, yeah, so we're going to start here um, with these chaps. So we're going to start in, a, in France in the 1800s. And what happened then was that a duck, a sheep, and a rooster you didn't think that was where the story was going to start, but a duck, a sheep, and a rooster were the first living things ever to fly into the sky. And they were sent there by two Frenchmen. They were called the Montgolfier brothers, and they had come up with a, a unique invention, the hot air balloon. Now, the hot air balloon was seen as quite dangerous by them. They'd created it, but they didn't know if it really worked. So what they did was they sent this... They put a duck, a sheep, and a rooster inside, and they set it off on its way, let it fly sky high into the air, and it landed eight minutes later safely. No sheep, no duck, no rooster was harmed. Don't worry. So they got onto it, and they, they decided that maybe this was something that could work. This was something that worked quite well, so they thought they'd try it on someone else. But they still weren't sure if it worked properly. So they didn't want to get in it themselves, so they put two of their friends in there. I know, you don't want to be friends with these guys, terrible people. Um, so they let their friends float up into the air, and they flew across the sky, and they landed in a vineyard. And the Montgolfier brothers went to meet them, and they all drank champagne together with the king. And from that point onwards, they were always known for the relationship between alcohol and flight beginning. Um, and they've gone down in history as terrible friends, terrible pet owners, uh, but wonderful people for the creation of the hot air balloon. The next step along our journey comes about 100 years later with this chap, chap here. He's, uh, he's called Alberto Dumont, and he's an eccentric character. He's a, he's a very unique character. You'd never find him without a, a fancy little hat on and a glass of champagne in his hand. Um, and he created a lot of things. So he was absolutely obsessed with adventure, with the art of flight, with doing things that no one else had done before. And he was obsessed with being high up and obsessed with unusual dining experiences. So much so that inside his house, he built his own dining table seven foot high in the air um, with seven foot high dining chairs. And you can see here, that his, um, his butler is having to climb some stairs to be able to serve him dinner. He was moved to France originally uh, to study, but he became absolutely obsessed with the idea of ballooning and the sport of ballooning. So he'd hop into these balloons and he would fly across the city. And he would go from restaurant to restaurant, from bar to bar, 
almost like a, a bar hopping, a bar crawl um, in a hot air balloon. So we'd drop down to his favorite bar, he would have a martini, he would fly on to the next one, which seems like a pretty dangerous thing to do, I have to be honest, but that was one of the things he liked to do. He was an eccentric individual and he was one of the early pioneers of aviation. He created things like this plane here. So that would have been filled with, with gas um, and somehow he managed to fly it across the sky. Um, and there's actually a story of uh, him flying across the sky in one of these, these vehicles and him crashing it into a garden. Now that garden was owned by a baroness who was quite a fan of his. She thought he was a, a fairly devilishly handsome gentleman and he crashed it right into a tree and he ended up wrapped up inside the branches of that tree. So she decided that he's had a hard day so we should, we should do something nice for him. So she organizes an afternoon tea and she has it sent out to the tree. It's got things like cakes and sandwiches but also punches and punch bowls full of things for him to drink and champagne. And they sit together under this tree. He's still wrapped up inside the branches of it, drinking punch together. And he was known for that love, love of cocktails and love of flying. Meanwhile, down on Earth, um, for a moment, you have things like the Orient Express. So the Orient Express began running in 1883 it was the most glamorous, the most luxurious of trains. It became known as the, the king of trains, and it made its way across Europe from, from Paris to Constantinople, which is obviously Istanbul now. Um, and it was like transporting their, their guests to another world and to another place, and doing something entirely different from what they'd ever been able to see or ever been exposed to before. Um, this kind of, there's a description, I've got, I've got a little description of what it would have been like on board. So incredibly opulent, if you look at these dining rooms, they've left no expense, nothing is to spare in here. And there's a description from the 1880s which talks about the bright white tablecloths and napkins which were artistically and coquettishly folded by the sommeliers. It talks about the glittering glasses, the ruby red and topaz white wine, the crystal clear water decanters, the punches, the silver capsules of champagne. All of these things are hugely extravagant. They're a huge experience in themselves. And when you think about the fact that this train was moving at quite a fast speed, the fact that people were running around pouring champagne shows the commitment to creating an incredible experience for their guests. The kind of drinks they'd have been having on board were things like the, the Pousse Café, or Pousse Café. My French is terrible, I have to apologize for that. <clears throat> this is kind of like, I suppose we look at this drink now as the B-52. Um, it's a layered drink, we think it's quite easy to do, but back then, it appears in the Bon Vivant's Companion, and it's described as a fancy drink. This is seen as one of the most extravagant or wonderful things you could possibly think to drink. But this sums up the level of service and the level of experience that the people on board, things like the Orient Express, were willing to kind of create for their customers. Um, time passes by, and what you have is we're talking about airships again. So this is, it's moved on a little bit since we were back um, with Alberto Dumont. Things have stepped up a notch, and you've got these, these big, almost like sausages floating in the sky. They're similar to the ones that, that we created at Hendrix. And they were kind of like dreamlike hotels. They would float across the sky about 10 times slower than, than a regular plane. And if, in a good wind, they'd probably hit up to about 70 miles an hour. So they weren't going very fast at all. But they had so many exciting things on board. They'd have um, kind of promenade decks where you could sit and you could have a nice drink, like a martini or martinez, and you could watch the world go by as you floated across the sky. Um, they would have things like a bar. Of course, you need a bar. Every, every good floating hotel needs a cocktail bar, where they would serve the same drinks that you could get right down on Earth. And they would also have smoking rooms, which is pretty dangerous because this entire thing is floating because of gas. So you had people wandering around with lit cigarettes, smoking away with the high chance that they could burn the whole plane down. 
but people like to play fast and loose. They like to play it pretty risky back in the day. What you've also got back down on Earth is the Titanic. So the luxury of cocktails wasn't just reserved for the skies. It was also very much available on the seas. So the White Star Line, who produced the Titanic, they knew that they couldn't create the most fast boat on the water, but they knew that they could create the most luxurious, the most elegant, the most wonderful thing. And they could create an experience for their customers that nobody else could even possibly think of. These were what some of the rooms on, on, on the ship would have looked like. So this is throughout the first and second class carriages, all the, all the rooms would have looked a little bit like this. Very opulent, very elegant. This is an incredible bar. Even today, by today's standards, this is the kind of bar that you would absolutely love to go into. Um, sorry. Um, so to put it into context, a ticket on board would have cost $2,360. That's the most expensive ticket on board the Titanic. Um, so to put that into today's money, that's about $61,000, which is a crazy amount when you think about it. And that was for a four-day journey. So you've got to imagine the kind of the incredible time you've got to show someone, the incredible drinks you've got to make for someone if they're on board a ship for four days and they paid $61,000 to be on there. It's pretty, um, pretty crazy. And they would have had a range of drinks on board. So they would have had things like the Tom Collins, the John Collins, the Martinez, and the Manhattan. So drinks that you could quite easily find back down on Earth. Um, but they also would have had, on the, on the last, very last meal, they would have had this drink here. It's called a punch romaine. And a punch romaine was inspired by a French chef called uh, Gustave Escoffier. So a really important chef. He was kind of like the big chef of that era. And he created this drink using lots and lots of ice, which is ironic considering the, the Titanic got hit by some ice. Um, it's got a granita. It's got some orange, lemon, rum, white wine, and some champagne. Um, and it was seen as a palate cleanser, something very unique that he would have had during that final dinner. Um, so it was the last cocktail that all of those people on board, for many of them, would have drunk. So it's an important drink in some ways. Meanwhile, time passes by, and we find ourselves at the beginning of Prohibition. So 1919, and obviously 1933, Prohibition runs in the United States. But by 1922, what you find is a lot of people within the United States were, they were, they were kind of sick and tired of not drinking anymore. So what you've got is an airline called Air, the Aero Marine Company. They were, have been primarily known for sending mail or sending freight across the ocean. But they had a lot of these small, light aircrafts. And they had a base in the Hudson River. So what you would get is a lot of the most outstanding, the most wild-minded, the most thirsty, I suppose, Americans of the era would step aboard these planes. They would hide in amongst the, the letters and the freight. And they would fly from the dry United States of America to the wet countries like Cuba or um, um, also in the Bahamas as well. So these were known as the, the Blacktail Fleet. Um, and they were also known as the Highball Express by some people. It's actually, these planes are, are, are why Blacktail in New York, the, the bar, is, is named after these, these planes. And they would end up in bars which would look a little bit like this. So they would end up in places like La Floridita in Cuba, and then also Sloppy Joe's in Cuba, and this place, the Bimini Bay Rod and Gun Club, um, with this very grumpy looking bartender behind the stick. Um, moving on, you've got the Hindenburg. Now, the Hindenburg obviously was a, a fateful, fateful uh, airship, but this is absolutely massive. To put it in, it's absolutely colossal. This like a massive floating silver sausage, I suppose. Um, and again, it was hugely luxurious on board, and it had this really excellent bar. And that bar would have had things like uh, large silk paintings on the wall showing exotic locations, locations showing really unique things. But they made a mistake. On their first ever journey, they forgot to pack some stuff. They forgot to pack gin. 
It's a terrible disaster, right? It's, nobody wants to have that on their first journey. It's a real mistake to make. So what they had to do was they had to create a new cocktail. They created one using Kirschwasser um, and also dry vermouth and a little bit of grenadine and a lemon twist. Not a particularly nice tasting drink, I can't imagine, but that's what they were drinking during that time. Um, and it's obviously not the, the worst disaster to, to fall upon, upon the Hindenburg. Then you've got Pan Am. So time passes by, the wars happen. During the 50s and 60s, airline travel becomes hugely exciting again. You've got people stepping on board these planes, wearing their finest clothes, looking as, as dapper and as delightful as they possibly can, looking as smart as they possibly can. And they would have drunk whiskey, and they would have drunk cocktails throughout the entire journey. That wasn't just because it was a special occasion or an exciting thing to do, which it was. It was because they were terrified that these things were going to that they were going to crash. Uh, a little bit of feedback there. Uh, <laughs> these things were going to crash into the sea, and they were going to die. Um, on board, they would have had a whole load of different things. They would have had butlers pouring you drinks. They would have had restaurants from Paris creating six-course tasting menus, which you could drink throughout the entire journey and eat throughout the entire journey. And it was an illustrious and exciting and beautiful place to be. There was a huge amount of glamour and excitement about the travel during that era. Time passes by, and what you've got is Concorde. Now, Concorde wasn't the most exciting plane in a lot of ways. It wasn't very pretty inside. They didn't have the same private rooms or private bars that, that a lot of these, these vehicles had done in the past. But what it did do was it flew incredibly, incredibly fast. Um, so nowadays, it takes about seven or eight hours to get between London and New York. This thing was going at between three, three and a half, three and four hours it would take. So hugely, hugely fast. It was traveling about 1,354 miles an hour. So if you were on board, you were sitting next to the fastest bar in the world. If you were drinking a gin and tonic, you were drinking the fastest gin and tonic in the world. Um, and it was breaking the speed of sound. So it was a pretty interesting and intriguing place to be. It's a very glamorous kind of way to fly and to enjoy and see the world. Nowadays, there's not quite the same level as gram of, of glamour on board these planes. Um, but United Airlines recently sparked controversy because they, they decided they were going to ban tomato juice. Um, they were stopping people from having tomato juice on their flights. They decided that they'd had enough serving it. Lufthansa have done the same. They were like, no, nah, people don't like tomato juice. They don't want to drink it. They don't enjoy it. And they couldn't work out why people were drinking so much of it. But people rose up. They were angry. People loved the tomato juice. There was an internet campaign against those airlines because of this. They were so passionate about their tomato juice. And the reason people love tomato juice on these flights so much is because there's a lower air pressure and there's a lower humidity. So it does crazy, crazy things to our taste buds. It makes us really yearn for things which have a lot of umami, a lot of powerful flavors, a lot of deep flavors. And things like the Red Snapper or the Bloody Mary and things like gin and tonics are the perfect things to enjoy on these flights. Up in the sky, back up in the sky again. Um, other drinks which have kind of worked um, have been on the International Space Station. So in the International Space Station and the US Space Station, what you have is no one's really allowed to drink anything. The drinking is banned. So the US Space Station, they once considered allowing people to drink sherry, but they decided against it. But on the Mir Space Station, you were allowed to drink a whole host of different things. You were allowed to drink ginseng liqueur. Um, you were allowed to drink certain, certain drinks. And you were also able to drink champagne on special occasions like New Year. So not only were these the, the highest drinks ever on record, they were also um, some of the fastest. So they were traveling about 17,200 miles an hour, which is uh, quite fast, I have to say. Um, nowadays, air travel looks a, bit, a little bit more like this. It's not as glamorous. It's not as exciting. It's not as intriguing. You get your legs crushed. This was me earlier today, this morning. I'm sure it was the same case for a lot of you in the room as well. Um, 
the drinks aren't very good, but some people are, are trying to do things differently. So remember we spoke about the Orient Exp Express earlier on. Um, in 1977, that stopped running. Um, and they sold off all the, all the carriages at an auction. But what happened was there's a chap called James Sherwood, and he went out and he bought every single carriage. He sourced them all, he refurbished them, he reconditioned them, he brought them back to their former glories and their former powers, and he made them look spectacular. Now, every single one of these carriages has its own unique history, its unique stories. And this is the bar car. The bar car has been around since 1931. Um, and it's a hugely important part of the train because it's the hub. It's where everyone comes together. It's where everyone receives a post-dinner drink, a, a pre-dinner drink. It's where they, they all meet and they mingle. Um, and they're doing some really interesting things. On, on board, you're, you're getting the same kind of quality of drinks that you would in some of the best bars in the world. It looks as well like any hotel bar that you walk into on any city on the planet. Um, and this guy... Look at me, this is a moving train. You gotta think about this. This guy's walking up and down the train. I can barely carry a tray when, uh, when I'm standing still on like, steady ground. But this guy's running up and down this carriage, delivering drinks like there's no trouble in the world. It's an impressive thing to be able to do. You've also got, over in Atlanta, you've got a place called um, One Flew South. And that's in Atlanta airport. So Atlanta's the busiest airport in the world. So they looked at things a little differently there. What they wanted to do was they wanted to create a drinks program, to create something which would really stay with people. They saw that most airport bars were, were boring, they were dull, they were the kind of place you went to kill time, to waste time. They were the kind of place that you had a drink because you'd had a stressful day. But they wanted to create a destination bar inside an airport. They wanted to create something that people would, would stay at, they would enjoy, they would make the effort to travel to. Um, and they achieved that, and they're, they're regarded as one of, the, one of the best bars in the United States as a result. You've also got people like Dandelion, like, best, like employees only, bars from all over the world working with airlines to create incredible drinks and incredible bar experiences and bring the glamour and the luxury back to travel. And you've even got people, you can even do it yourself. So you can sit on board and you can take one of these kits on and you, you can knock out top class cocktails while you sit at your seat. So a lot of people nowadays are trying to bring cocktails in the sky and the ancient art of, of that back to life. Um, so I suppose I, I just wanted to show you that there's no better time. You can drink a cocktail at any time. There's never a bad time to sit and to enjoy a cocktail. Um, it's the ultimate luxury, it's the ultimate wonder, it's the ultimate incredible thing to be able to do. Um, and we need to bring the delight back to how we travel. Um, so the next time you're aboard an aircraft, I want you to raise a glass and remember to travel slower, to enjoy the little things during your journeys. Um, and remember that it's not about getting somewhere fast, it's about the journey, and it's about getting somewhere well. That's everything from me, guys. Um, thank you all very much for coming down and listening. Um, it's been a pleasure to come to Kiev, um, and I'll see you, see you all later.